So here we go with our discussion of Rambam and repentance. The, uh, the Rambam really wrote uh, one of the first treatises I know of on repentance, uh, and it became really one of the main sources for thinking about repentance in a more organized, legalistic, and, 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 and deep kind of way. The, the Rabbeinu Yona, a few hundred years later, he wrote Sharei Tshuva, a wonderful book about, about Tshuva, really expanding on the Rambam's uh, writings. Um, but uh, none was as uh, intriguing as the 10 chapters the Rambam had on Tshuva. Now, a lot of the 10 chapters, as we'll see, are talking about free will, talking about punishment, talking about re reward. And so it's not, there aren't 10 chapters of repentance, of the laws of repentance. But, uh, but just the idea of having a book called Laws of Repentance was kind of a revolutionary uh, kind of an idea. This is part of the Rambam's more uh, broad agenda that he's not just going to have a legal book uh, called um, that, that has classic laws, of the laws of blessings, laws of uh, holidays, laws of uh, women's marriage and things like that, and, and laws of, uh, uh, of torts and damages and all that. But he's also going to have the laws of philosophical things. He's also going to have the laws of, of beliefs and the laws of... So t having a section that's called the laws of teshuva is not the Talmudic kind of thing. There's no tractate teshuva in the Talmud. There are tractates that talk about it. When they're talking about Yom Kippur, talking about Rosh Hashanah, they may talk about teshuva, but there's no tractate for it. So the idea of having separate laws of teshuva this is kind of a new and radical uh, idea. Uh, so let's take a look at, at the Rambam and repentance because it's such, an, such, such a big topic, such an intriguing thing. So I want to just give you a smattering of, of different uh, issues that come up in the Rambam, classic issues, the Rambam repentance. Um, so let's, let's take a look. Uh, so firstly, there's some interesting puzzles that have intrigued people. And just every year, it's just fun to, to do, go over these puzzles again because you can never sort of solve them. Uh, and there are many puzzles, and every line of the Rambam is riddled with puzzles because um, the Rambam is synthesizing so much material. He has to get in this idea and that idea, this source and that source, and to synthesize it all in one place makes like an atomic bomb. It's so dense that it kind of explodes, and um, it's, it's, it just has so much in it that everybody's mining it for all the good stuff is in it, and every year it just explodes again. And you think you're done with it, you figure it out, and then you come back the next year, and it's a puzzle again. So here's some of the puzzles. We have a contradiction between the introduction of the Rambam to the laws of repentance and the laws of themselves, right? In every book, you might have an introduction, and then you say something there, and then when you get to the body of the, you know, the meat of the book, you say something else. That's a contradiction. So Rambam writes, tshuva. So mitzvah seyachas. There's one mitzvah in this whole book. There's only one mitzvah. Some books have many mitzvah. This one only has one. What is it? That you should that the sinner should go back from his sin, should go away from his sin, should repent from his sin. The word repentance is sort of implied there. Yashuv, tshuva. Is that a person should repent from his a sinner should repent from his sin in front of God? Does that mean his sin in front of God? Or he should repent in front of God? Not clear. And he should confess. So it's a mitzvah to repent and confess. But I thought it was only one mitzvah. So that's the first puzzle. Second puzzle, the, in the laws themselves, he starts off, he says, any mitzvah you do, positive, negative, if you violate any of them, intentionally, not intentionally, or even unintentional sins require teshuva, when you do teshuva and you go away, yashuv, you, 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 you go away from the sin, then you have to, you're obligated to confess. So here he says, in the first mitzvah, he said, the mitzvah is to repent and to, and to confess. Now he says, whenever you repent, you must confess. But he doesn't say it's a mitzvah to, to repent. He just says, when you repent, it's a mitzvah to confess. So the obligation is confessing, not repenting. At the beginning, he said that the mitzvah is to repent, that the sinner should repent from his sin and confess. But that itself is a puzzle. Is it confession or is it tshuva? So which one is it? Deepening our, our problem even further, we say, well, he, he didn't say it was a, a mitzvah to confess. He didn't say that. Some say, you know, of course you should repent. I mean, if you did the wrong thing, you should always do the right thing, right? If I insulted you, I should, I should make amends. I mean, 
if you're not supposed to eat trafe, so then you should stop doing it and think about it, right? But um, so it's, it's obvious. What you need to do, it's not obvious, is that you should confess, that you should, you know, say it with words. Um, but lest you think that the, it's not a mitzvah to repent according to Rambam, it's just when you repent, you have to confess. And the mere real, real mitzvah is confession. So he says, well, wait a second. All the prophets command, he said, he writes later on, much later on, seventh chapter, all the prophets commanded about tshuva. Commanded? I thought it's not a commandment. And the Jews are only uh, redeemed with teshuva, and as it's already promised that we would do tshuva, etc. He quotes a verse that God, that, that you will repent, and, and God will bring you back, and you will go back. So uh, it says that they tzivu, they commanded about teshuva. So it sounds like it is a mitzvah. So first we said it was a mitzvah, then it sounds like it wasn't a mitzvah, then later it sounds like it is a mitzvah. So which one is it? This is part of the puzzles of the Rambam. Then he keeps asking the question, what is Teshuvah? Uh, and what is Vidui? What is, so we need to understand, you know, what's there? Maybe it's the same thing. Repentance and uh, confession, it's the same thing. It's not a contradiction. You have to, there's only one mitzvah, to repent before God and confess. So apparently they're all part of one thing, right? Well, let's see. So he says, well, how do you confess? Well, you say, An Hashem. An Hashem. You have to say, please God. Why do you have to say, please God? So the, uh, the Salvation thought that he got this from the high priest, who, you know, if you recall the Chazan's tunes on Yom Kippur, An Hashem, Chatati, please God, please God, let me in, let me confess, let me, let me repent, let me return to you. Chatati, I have sinned to you in different ways, and I did such and such, and I, reg I regret it, and I'm ashamed of my deeds, and I'll never go back to that, and that's the, main, that's the essence of Vidui. So vidu is that you, uh, you you confess. So he says he's never going to go back. And so part of the confession is to say that he's never going back, and he regrets it. So what is teshuva? Isn't teshuva to go back? Well, then he, then he asks the question, what is teshuva? So he says. So after two chapters, he finally says, oh by the way, what is teshuva? I, I thought you told me it's vidu, the confessional. So he says no, no. shuva is when you. When this is the famous Rambam, that the opportunity comes to you for the thing that you had sinned out on, and you go away from it, not because you're afraid, not because you have no power. He gives an example: person slept with a woman in sin in a way that he shouldn't have. Maybe she wasn't married, or maybe she was married, or she, maybe they weren't married, or maybe maybe she was a nida, or she hadn't gone to the mikvah, or maybe maybe she was someone he wasn't so supposed to sleep with, and then maybe she wasn't Jewish, maybe. Uh, prostitution. Anyway, it could be a lot of different things. And after a while, he was with her alone again. Why anyone would do that, I don't know if he's trying to repent, but somehow he was alone with her again. And he still loves her. And he still has the physical drive to do so. And he's still in the same place where he was before. You know, it's not like new circumstances. And he stopped himself and he, 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 he abstained. He did not do the sin. That's a complete Baal Shuba. That's complete Shuba. That's complete tshuva. So the, the tshuva is not an act, it's a state of being. Because when he gets to the point where he doesn't do it again, then he really stopped doing it. And we see that he's not doing it again. He's not habituated to it. He's not so habituated that he's compelled to do it. Then he's good. But the Ramam asks the question again, what is tshuva? So he asks the question, what is complete tshuva? And then he says, what is tshuva? He already told us tshuva is when you get to, this, to the point that you don't do it anymore. Well, he says, well, no, plain juva, it's not complete juva, but plain juva, just to leave the sin, take it out of your heart, and decide not to do it again. And you should feel bad about the past. And then there's an ambiguous expression. He says, I'll read it two ways. He should make God the witness, that he'll never go back to it again. He said, to say, God, you're my witness. I swear to you, I'm never going back to that again. Rabbi Salvagic suggests it might be an oath. Second possibility, he says, you have to get to the point that you feel so bad about it that God, would, the one who knows all the secrets, God who knows the secrets, would testify that you'll never do it again. Because you, you have so much resolve. How much resolve do you have? So much that God would say you're never going to go back to it. See, because only God can say that. If you say it the other way, then you say, God, you're my witness. I'm never going to go back to it. 
How do you know that? Come on, how do you know that? You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. Is there a mitzvah to say, look, I resolve not to do it. I'm thinking in my heart, I might want to do it again, but, but I'm saying that I'm not going to do it. Is that a mitzvah to say something you're not sure if it's true? And you're going to make God, and then you can make it worse by making God your witness in some sort of oath that you're not going to do it again? Or no, you should just resolve. And then hopefully it's so resolved that God would testify that you're never going to go back to it again. Anyway, it has to be very serious that you're not going to go back. Um, and you have to say these words in your mouth. Uh, Shira mentioned before that there are some mitzvahs with the heart, some are in the mouth and with the lips, and some are in action. And uh, it seems that tshuva is in action. You refrain from certain actions. Um, it also has to be with your lips. It also has to be in your heart. The idea is that you decide it in your heart, you express it in your, in your mouth, and you carry it out with your deeds as well. So first he said that tshuva, complete tshuva, is not to do, actually not to do it. And we know that you're not going to do it because you, you had an opportunity and you didn't. The second, then he says, no, tshuva is just to decide that you're not going to do it. Even if you haven't been tested yet, it's also tshuva. He says the part of tshuva is to, to regret the past, decide you're not going to do it again. But that's what he said vidui was. Vidui confession is also, you, you, you said that you did it, you're embarrassed, and you said you're not going to go back to it, you never go back to it. So is there a difference between tshuva and vidui? These are part of the puzzles of the Rambam. We'll never figure out the actual thing. Then he mentioned something else. That is part of the way of tshuva to always cry out to God with, uh, with, with, with tears, with uh, beseeching God, my father remembers that my grand, uh, his grandfather used to cry on Yom Kippur. He suspected maybe when he came to America, he was so poor, he came with $18 in his pocket. He was so poor that, you know, he was forced to work on Shabbos and he, forevermore on Yom Kippur, he was always crying. So he says, why was he always crying? Because he he's always wants to keep it, keep it in mind that he had done something wrong. And he has to keep far away from that sin. He changes his name as if he's a different person he changes his deeds. He goes away, lives in a new place. The more you go away and you suffer from migration and the indignity of it, you know, which way is Kroger's, which way is the post office, um, it, you, you, you get atonement. And it makes you more humble. And it's all about being humble and crying to God. What's, what does this got to do with it? Was it dark air, tshuva, the ways of tshuva? But he told us what tshuva was. Now he's saying, oh, from the ways of tshuva, you have to always cry. Prayer is part of tshuva. Pray to God. You, Stay far away from it. So before he told us complete tshuva was to be in the same situation, same bad channel, same bad station, and he doesn't do it. Now he says, oh, the main thing is to stay far away from wherever you were before. Now how's he going to know if he, if he really repented? So these are part of the puzzles of the realm. Well, tonight we'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions. What about Yom Kippur? What about the tshuva of Yom Kippur? Does the Rambam address the laws of repentance on Yom Kippur? After all, he's talking about tshuva. Has to talk about Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. She says, "Look, teshuva is always good. Crying out to God, it's always a, it's always good to do. You can do teshuva anytime you want." The Rebbe Yona takes it a step further and says, "It's a mitzvah to do teshuva every day. Says, We're always doing something wrong, so it's a mitzvah every day to fix what we did wrong." And by Sarah's Yom Kippur should be not Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Yafa Yosef. It's particularly good between Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. What does that mean? What do you mean it's better? How is it better? Umiyadi Well, I'll tell you one way, because it's immediately accepted. You see, I might do tshuva and God say, after what you did, you think that's good enough? You feel bad about it? No way. I'm giving, I'm, I'm not going to forgive you yet. But no, but if you do it between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, it's accepted more, more quickly. Oh, so that's, that, oh, you understand, that's better. What does it mean that it's, 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 it's nicer, it's, it's better? What does that mean? It's exceedingly better. What does that mean? As it says in Isaiah, call out to God when he's close. So there's a time when God is close. That's only for an individual who needs it. But for a community, they can pray anytime. God is always close to us at all times. As the Talmud had explained, he's quoted from the Talmud. So you say, okay, so that's great. So Yom Kippur is a special time for tshuva. And that's what he writes, that Yom Kippur is his man tshuva for everybody, for the individual, for the community. It's the, it's the end of all forgiveness and for Israel. And therefore, everyone has to do tshuva and to confess in Yom Kippur. So first we said, that it's always a good mitzvah to do tshuva. Then he says, no, no, no. It's a mitzvah to do tshuva in Yom Kippur. So is there a separate mitzvah to do tshuva in Yom Kippur? We don't know. So 
But we do know what confession sounds like. We learned, we learned it before. You have to have a regret for the past, accept on yourself for the future. So he writes, that mitzvah, you have to do the vidui, the confessional, do it at night, before the meal, then after the meal, then in the morning, in the afternoon. The, 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 the congregation does it in the congregational amida. If you, if you go to shul, if you don't have COVID. So what's the confession on Yom Kippur? He says, well, um, oh, I'm sorry, getting the wrong text here. Um, the confessional is, in an Abu Kol Yisrael, the confessional that everybody says is chatan. We have sinned. Kulan, we have all sinned. Wait, if Yom Kippur is a time of tshuva, tshuva is, has to do with confession. Confession is that you feel bad about the past and you're going to do better in the future. How can on Yom Kippur, you, all you do is you say, we have sinned. So it sounds like maybe Yom Kippur, it's a different teshuva. Yom Kippur is a teshuva of, we have sinned, that's all. So for many years, I mentioned in the video the other day, for many years I thought like this. A real teshuva has all the elements. You regret the past, you don't feel embarrassed, you accept by yourself for the future. But Yom Kippur, it's not a full tshuva. Yom Kippur, God asks all of us to simply confess that we've sinned. And that's good enough for Yom Kippur. It's not the real, real deal. I saw the Mabit this year. It's a rabbi from 500 years ago from North Africa. And he said, Yom Kippur is a special gift. I don't know if this is true in the Rambam, but Mabit thought so. It could be true here. Yom Kippur is a special gift. And on Yom Kippur, if you merely confess, you do an a, a, a partial teshuva, it counts as a full teshuva. During the year, you have to, teshuva is what, is what we said it was. You got to go, you got to cry before God. You got to take it out of your heart. You got to decide not to do it again. But Yom Kippur, God gives us a break. He says, if you could just, if you could just say we have sinned, it's good enough. And God forgives you anyway. So it could be in Yom Kippur, the standards are lower, the bar is lower or higher. And the bar is different. I know it's gonna, it's you don't say I, 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 I won't do this again, Blade Nader. <laughs> right, right, right. There is one, if you get to the end of your prayer, if you ever get to the end of Shmon Esrei, it says, may it be your will, God, that I not return to this again. Now, Rabbi Salvechik thought that that could imply, um, that could imply, uh, may it be your will, God, that I never go back to this sin. So he thought that's sort of like saying, look, God, you're my witness. I'm never going back to this sin. I don't think so. I think it's just saying, look, this is, this is a printed prayer. We don't know if anybody's going to really never go back to that sin again. We can't write a printed prayer that says, Joel Finley's never going to go back to that sin again. Joel Finley has to decide if he's going to do that. He says, what we can write is that we hope, you know, we hope we're going to, like uh, Shira says, bleed netter. I'm not making any vows, but I hope I'm going to do it. Right. Why is that funny, what Shira said? Because we said that it's, it's almost like an oath you have to say. So much, it's so sincere that God himself would testify, Joel Finley will never do that again. But if I say, well, I hope to do it, but I'm not making any vows about it, that's not serious. That's like the epitome of being not serious. They say, if I say, yeah, mom, I'll, I'll take out the garbage, but I'm not making any vows about it. That's sort of like saying, I'm not going to take out the garbage. Okay. So, um, so it, it's very strange. So on Yom Kippur, in the printed text, we don't actually say, I'm never going to do it again. Obviously, it's better if people would. The Ram doesn't seem to require it. He says, the custom is we just say, we have sinned. That's good enough. You can make a whole laundry list of things you did. But main thing is, we, we sinned. And on Yom Kippur, maybe that's good enough. Because maybe Yom Kippur Tshuva is different. Um, you know, so it's another puzzle in the Ram. Back to the Ram. <clears throat> Rabbi? Yes. Is it because it's a whole list of sins that you're asking forgiveness for and not a single one? Um, it's a good question. Uh, therefore what? Therefore you, you can't say I'm never going to do it again because there's so many different things. Yeah, we, have to, uh, we have to clarify uh, which one. Is, is that what you're saying? You can't say Yeah, I mean, if you're... 
like you said before about the man who maybe did adultery or something like that and was sorry and said he was never going to do it again or somebody that's an alcoholic and trying to stop and talks to God and says, I'm going to stop and I'm never going to do it again. And, and he makes the vow and, and at that point or whatever the sin is, it's a one sin that he's talking about. But on Young Kipper, there's this whole list and liturgy of stuff that we're talking. But even if we go through the list, like I didn't commit adultery this year. <laughs> so I'd be more focused in on the things that I did do. Right. Yeah, so. but we're still we're still talking about twenty things, thirty things, forty things all at once. I'm wondering if that's just why the Rambam says that you don't have to th that. God says, okay, you just, if you ask, you're forgiven. Okay, so let's continue. Sorry. All right, so uh, the Rambam, you see, the end's point is, is well taken in terms of our prayers today because we specify all of our sins. So how are you supposed to um, say you're not going to go back to any of those things? There's too many things. You have to think about each one. However, in the Rambam, the Rambam seems to take the position that you don't have to specify the sins. He doesn't, um, uh, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, when he says that, that all you need to do is just say, we have sinned, it seems that he's, claim, that he's agreeing with those who say that you don't need to um, specify the sin. So, um, uh, so in the Rambam, um, the, idea, the, the question remains, if you're just saying you didn't sin in general, why don't you just say you're not going to sin in general? I guess the answer could be what? That's very difficult to say, you, you, right? If on a regular day, you're, you're trying to repent from a, something particular. So that would, so it's easy to, to achieve that. But on, on Yom Kippur, you're trying to repent in general. And that would be more difficult to say, I'm never going to go back to any of the problems that I have in any sort of realm. That would be very difficult. Maybe that's part of the problem. Very good. I like that. Let's continue. Another unusual feature uh, of the Rambam in the laws of tshuva is his idea of repentance from character. What do I mean? He says, I'll tell him change tshuva my affairs based on my mindset. You might think the only tshuva you need to do is for things that where you did a wrong act, like immorality, stealing, and the like. And then you need to repent from those. So too, you need to repent from and seek out your ways in all sorts of bad um, thoughts that you have um, bad thinking, anger, uh, hatred, jealousy, competitiveness, uh, or even he tool. He tool is um, uh, mockery, or um, how does he translate it here? Um, you know, being being sort of a cynic, uh, cynicism, um, or chasing money, chasing honor, chasing food, and things like that. From all of this, you need to repent. And these are even more difficult than the actual physical discrete sins because when you're stuck in all this, it's hard to get out of it, right? And as it says in Isaiah, every person should leave their way and their thoughts. So teshuva is not just about actions, it's about character. So that's very, very interesting as we'll, as we'll see in a moment. Um, so the idea of teshuva on character. If you look in classical sources, we're talking about sins. Tshuva is something you do from sins. He's saying you have anger problems. You have to do tshuva from that as well. Then there's, uh, so that's an, an interesting feature in the Rambam's laws of tshuva. Now, that is an interesting question. And that is, at the beginning, we were very technical. We said, this is what tshuva is, this is what repentance is. This is complete tshuva. This is complete repentance. This is complete um, uh, confessional, the better confessional, other elements of confessional. 
It was kind of a technical discussion. But the Rambam later on in chapter seven, he waxes poetical. We'll talk about it more tonight. He says, Tshuva is so great, it brings you close to God. As it says, return unto God. And God says, come to me. And if you come, you should return to me. And you should cling to me. If you right? And Tshuva brings people from far away. He brings them close. If last night you were disgusting for, before God, today God loves you and you're his best friend. And, um, and, and God says that instead of calling you, you know, you're not my people, he'll call you my people and et cetera, et cetera. So it's such beautiful language. What, 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 why and where does the Rambam wax so poetical? What is it? We'll learn tonight, God willing, more about that. He also says it's amazing. Chuva is so amazing because last night you, you were far away from God and now you're clinging to God. You call out to God. He answers you right away. You do a mitzvah, God's thrilled, he loves it. He desires your mitzvahs. He, it's so pleasant to him when you do mitzvahs, it's unbelievable. So it's interesting, why does the Rambam wax so poetic and what is it all about? So all of these are part of the, the mysteries of the Rambam and tonight we'll talk more about some of the answers. Then the Rambam talks about reward and punishment, which we're not gonna get into, which doesn't seem to have that much to do with tshuva. And then he says that really you shouldn't worship, you should not worship God at it for, for the sake of reward, which is a famous mission in Perky Avos. Don't worship God. Don't be like a servant who worships God just to get reward. He says, why should you worship God? Out of love. And if you worship out of love, you engage in Torah and mitzvot, and you engage in the ways of wisdom. Again, according to the Rambam, engaging in wisdom is part of being a Jew. Um, not just Torah wisdom, all wisdom. And not because of anything particular, not because you're afraid of something bad is going to happen, not in order to get something, a special reward. You just want to do the truth because it's true. And then you figure good things will probably happen, but that's not the main reason. And this is really great. Not everybody's able to achieve this. Abraham achieved it. He's known as the one who loves God. Oh, have he, the lover of God. And he only worshiped God out of love. And and Hashem says, you should worship God. You should love God with all of your heart and your soul and your might. And when you worship God out of love, when you, when you love God, then you'll do all the mitzvot out of love. So why is that interesting? Because we need to understand something about the Rambam's organization. The Rambam was a master organizer. The idea of deciding what the law is, that came to him like secondhand. 99.9% .9 of the laws in the Rambam, he wrote it, never changed his mind. They never crossed it out or anything. If you look in the Ramah's manuscript, he does change the order. So he's very conscious of the order. Where does this paragraph go before that paragraph or not? And the Ramah created this whole structure called the Mishnah Torah, the, the second Torah. Um, and it's like a rewriting of the Mishnah. And he adds books that are not in the Mishnah. The Mishnah does not have a book of knowledge, Mada. It does not have a book of love, Ahava. It's only his book that has these these sections. Now in this, this very creative new book that he created, in this, the Mishnah only has six departments. He has, a, he has a 14th department called knowledge. What's in there? The main foundations of the Torah, the fundamentals of the Torah, and belief in God and love and fear and all that. And then he talks about character. Does that sound familiar? We've been talking about character and tshuva, right? So the laws of character, but not getting angry too much, and all the things, Pirkei Avos type of things. And his laws of learning Torah. And his laws of idolatry, because it's about your knowledge, about your ideas, not allowed to think that there's many gods. And then he has tshuva. Now, you might have thought that tshuva belonged in the laws of love. If he said that, if in the laws of tshuva, he talks about love, so maybe love is the essence of tshuva, and that God, once you do tshuva, God loves you so much. Maybe it's even the laws of, of, of love. No, we put it over here. And the last chapter of Mada, he talks about Ava. In the last chapter about knowledge and character, he talks about love. So the placement of Teshuva on the cusp between knowledge and love is very important because it's about getting your idea straight. I want to follow God. I don't want to go against God. And it's about loving God and worshiping God out of love. And the Teshuva that you do out of love is the highest Teshuva. So the Rambam has it organized so like this. The laws of love 
He has to read Nishma, which reminds us how much we love God. Tefillah, you stand before God, you get close with God. Tefillah and Mezuzah are an expression of our love for God. Sits is a reminder of God. We make blessings to, because we love God and all the things he gave us. We do a bris milah because we also apparently love God. It's part of that, covenant with God. And all the prayers. So that's the laws of love. Uh, so the, the, the teshuva, he put between, he put it in the laws of knowledge, the book of knowledge, but he put it right next to the laws of love because it's connected to that. And the last thing he talked about in teshuva was love. So where did the laws of teshuva fit in? It's between the laws of knowledge, faith and character, and the laws of love and devotion. That's where teshuva fits in. That's interesting in terms of the Rambam's uh, structure. Then finally, I wanted to suggest a historical connection that made the Rambam a particular lover of teshuva. And it's not surprising that Rambam is one of the first people to write a treatise on teshuva. Why? Because he played a major role in the conversos of his day. Usually you think of conversos, hidden Jews, you think of the Jews of Spain, but there was also, of course, the Jews of Yemen. Jews of Yemen suffered from particular persecution where there was a certain pseudo-Messiah who believed that he was, he was there to combine Judaism and Islam, and he claimed that he was a new prophet and the Jewish community had to convert. So they were stuck there. So there was a rabbi there who said, well, Maybe if this is a new prophet and, you know, we have all these problems, maybe it was prophesied. Maybe it's a special sign from God that, you know, we, we have sinned. We're so bad. God made this happen to us. And um, it's, it's a sign from God, from the constellations, that we were not good enough. And that's why we have these problems. So he said, look, uh, that's not really important. What's important is, you got to stay strong in your Torah mitzvahs. If you need to go to the mosque once in a while, profess that you believe in Muhammad, that's one thing. But be sure to put on your tzitzis and your tefillin. And he gave them encouragement, strength, consolation. And forevermore, the Jews of Yemen were always grateful to the Rambam that he saved them, that he encouraged them. He did say that if they could ever move out of Yemen, that would be good. But he encouraged them at this time of forced conversion. And um, so, I don't know. Maybe, excuse me, maybe there's some connection between the Rambam um, and his, uh, his role that he played in helping the, the Jews of Yemen repent and this, this, uh, the laws of Teshuvah. So who knows, maybe there is. Any event, um, so that's a little bit about the, the Rambam and Teshuvah. The Rambam is uh, the ultimate uh, master of Teshuvah because he wrote this incredible treatise and he also played an important role historically in helping some of the Jews repent. And um, we talked about some of the puzzles of the Rambam, uh, the fact that we're not even sure if he thinks it's a mitzvah to do tshuva, and um, talk about that more uh, tonight. And Mir Tashem and Avli And um, the, he definitely thinks it's a mitzvah because he said that the prophets commanded about it. But in any event, uh, we weren't sure what the difference between the confessional and the tshuva was. What's the main thing? What, what, what's, what's the difference between tshuva and tshuva gemura? What does it mean that you, that you make God your witness, that you're not going to repent, or that you should get to the point where it's so good that God would say that you're never going to go back to it? Which one is it? Um, why does he talk about this other idea of, of, of going far away from the sin? I thought the whole tshuva was to be in the same place and be able to overcome. Um, and then what's the tshuva on Yom Kippur? doesn't seem to be the same as the regular tshuva. On the other hand, it sounds like Yom Kippur is the day for tshuva. That's, that's the time for tshuva. You know, sukkah is the time to shake a lulav. And uh, Shavuot is the time we talk about the Torah. And Yom Kippur is the time of tshuva. I thought the regular tshuva. It turns out the tshuva of Yom Kippur is different from the regular tshuva. And um, we, we mentioned that the Rambam is very unusual and that he introduces the notion of tshuva for character, uh, which was a little bit unusual. And um, we mentioned that the Rambam gets very excited about the tshuva that one does out of love and that it serves as an, an introduction to the next book, which is all about love. And the Shema and the Amida and everything else we do, the Tzillin and the Zuzim and the Tzitzit, it all connects to the love of God that we have. And finally, we mentioned the Rambam's historical connection and role he played in helping the Jews of Yemen uh, return and stay Return to Judaism and remain Jewish. So that's some thoughts on the Rambam and Teshuvah.